that the indigenous people began to build links among themselves. In the Caribbean, we had the formation of what is called the Caribbean Organization of Indigenous People, COIP, C-O-I-P for short, which helped to strengthen links, particularly between the Garcona of Belize and the Vincent and Relatives, that was in 1992. Rex Nettleford, a former Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies and a cultural icon, argued in 1992 that the people who were discovered, that is discovered in quotation marks, is referring to the courage. The people who were discovered had no say in how their history was written. And that in any case, they had been rendered marginalized and with little opportunity to tell the story as they felt it ought to be told. He argued that the history had to be rewritten and reconstructed through their own lives. And this is something which 1992 played an important part in stimulating the desire to do that. This brings us to what is referred to as history from below. What historian describes history from below as the history of those who were born without simple spoons in their mouths. The history which helps them to understand that they have a past, that they have come from somewhere. He goes on to say that it provides a means for restoring history to those social groups who may have thought that they had lost it all. Now, it is an extremely difficult task because in the case of the Caribbean and the indigenous people generally, the further back one goes, the more restricted are the sources. The Caribs, of course, left no writings. So the story we have about the Caribs is that given by the conquerors, by those who conquered them. What is at stake here is best summed up by one of my favorite African proverbs. Until the lions have the historian, tales of hunting will always glorify the hunter. Until the lions have the historian, tales of hunting will always glorify the hunter. This, of course, captures what I'm talking about. For it is the conqueror in this case, who, the conquerors who have been telling the story of Cathay and the Caribs. One has to do some serious detective work among the writings of the Europeans. And it is easy to see that when they referred to Chatelier as warlike and aggressive, they were actually describing a man who was trying to defend his country by any means necessary. So even looking among what they have written, it is possible to arrive at a picture of a man quite different from the one they left for us. I am surprised that the death of Chatelier, portrayed by Young and Shepherd, is still accepted. Chatelier's duel with Major Lee, in my opinion, is sheer fantasy. This was a battle fought about one o'clock on the morning of March the 15th in pitch dark. Why would Chatelier be fighting a duel? especially at that time, and especially given the fact that the Caribs' method of warfare is what we call to the guerrilla warfare. The English always be bemoaned the fact that the Caribs will never stand up and fight. The Caribs will hide themselves from them on trees and disguise themselves and fight against the Caribs. But the English wanted them to confront them directly, but they were involved in what we call to the guerrilla warfare. The reports, the official reports, included one from Governor Seaton, and accounts of persons who had participated in that battle present a different picture. The reports indicated that the British party, that is the party which left Sand Hill going up to Dorchester Hill, reached within 80 yards of the main force occupied by the Caribs before they were seen by a sentry. That is the left side hill, and um, when they were within 80 yards, 
of the main force. They were seen by a sentry. And it goes on to say that when they got within 20 yards, orders were given to fire a body and to charge. Another account said, we pass without noise into the fort and surprise the enemy. It was no fight. It was a mere regular slaughter. And in a few moments, the fort was cleared of the enemy. In none of the reports, including that of the governor, is major the mention. Governor Seaton singled out Captain Skinner and Campbell, and Lieutenant MacIver, but fails to mention Major Lee. Major Lee's tombstone, as I think most people should know, was placed in the Anglican Cathedral, and it had written on it, I quote, his death was occasioned by a great fatigue he endured during the Carib War, in which, as colonel of the militia, he bore a distinguished path, the Carib chief Chakwe, falling by his hand. Following Wationgo, Wationgo, this was really British psychological warfare, designed to show the superiority of their nature and to dampen the spirits of the Carib. And as I said, I'm surprised today that people still follow that account that there was some uh, duel fought by Chatelier and the Major Lee at one o'clock in the morning. Chatelier was said to have owned 1,000 acres of land in the Grand Belain area and was the holder of slaves. 300 acres of that land was cleared for agriculture and Chatelier and Duvalet benefited from loans and sureties from British gentlemen. Now, the question I ask, who are these slaves and who managed Chatelier's estate? Let us take our minds back to this period and imagine ourselves in that sort of historical environment. The Caribs had been for a long time trying to encourage the slaves to run away and join their ranks. And this is something they were continually doing. Why would then would the runaway slaves come to a place and colony where they could be re-enslaved? You know, you might say that ah, they didn't know. But as um, Dr. Honeychild said, there was this constant contact and communication between the two, so they knew exactly what was happening. And a number of slaves who ran away from plantations, particularly in Barbados and also Martin, knew that once they came to St. Vincent, they were going to find refuge among the Caribs. So it beats me that Shakira could have slaves at a time when they were encouraging slaves to come into the country. And um, one should ask, because they say he was helped by some of the British gentlemen, we could ask why in a situation of continuing tension with the Caribs and their French allies, would the British facilitate the production of sugar by Chatelier? The English planters always tried to prevent anybody else from participating in the sugar industry. Even after emancipation, they wanted to ensure that the former slaves did not get into sugar production. And to whom did Chatelier sell his slave? His arm sugar. Of interest too, it was stated that Governor Seaton, when he decided to attack the Caribs at Dorsetshire Hill, he was driven not only by the fear that once they controlled Dorsetshire Hill, they would be able to control the town, but there was also the fear by the governor that the message of emancipation which came from the Caribs would sway the slaves. So it doesn't really make sense at all if you're saying that you want to ensure that this message which the Caribs had would not get to the slaves, this message of emancipation. But at the same time, 
you are saying that chattel in fact has slaves. When all of this is considered, Chatelier's ownership of slaves becomes even more practical. And in my view, the whole strategy was to convince their home government that despite all their efforts, it was impossible to coexist with the Caribs. Hence, their long-standing request to have them removed. From very early, they were asking the British government to support and to give them permission to remove the Caribs from St. Vincent. And this is something which continues. So one of the things they are doing is trying to show we have gone out of a way to accommodate these people, but yet they are not prepared to go along. They tried to convince their home government that they were out to accommodate Chatley and his people. He received, according to Young's book, the most flattering attention and hospitality from Sir William Young, at whose house is a villa Young Island and on the estate he stayed. We are told that Young gave him a silver mounted sword engraved with their family arms, which was a memorial to his brother, that is Young's brother, who fell during the American Civil War at one of the battles in the United States. In 1876, on a visit to St. Vincent, the future king of England, William IV, was given, gave to Chatelier a gift of a collar-like piece of armor used to protect one's throat. He was therefore, in Young and in others' view, a schemer, pretending to be loyal to the crown while seeking to undermine the crown's authority and to obstruct and defeat his English subjects. This is the same Chatelier who earlier, when the English were trying to survey their lands, and they had given instructions to take to Chatelier by Frenchman, the Abbe Baladeris, Baladeris. Chatelier asked, when he was presented with these instructions, Chatelier asked, what king is that? He says, we know of none. So it, this is the same Chatelier who, as far as we are concerned, was a traitor to the British cause. There are still other questions unanswered as we seek to rehabilitate fully Chatelier, ah, something that is not quite complete. There's something I just want to mention briefly, which I do not have time to go into, but we are left with two very important proclamations, one by the French and the Hugues, urging the Caribs to support their struggle, and one by Chateau himself. And this was geared to the French people. It is said that this declaration of Chateau was found in one of the houses after Chateau was killed. The question is, who was that really designed for? Did it get to these French people? It was written in beautiful French. Chatelier understood French, but I don't think Chatelier wrote French. In fact, there's, um, there's a map representing his name. And what is also interesting about that is that the proclamation by the French revolutionary really dealt with the whole ethnic thing, encouraging the Caribs to join them and so on. But that from Chatelier was something as though it came from a French revolutionary. One has to ask the question, and um, was this something written by the English themselves to try to show that this person we were asked to trust, he was making this declaration, trying to get the French to join them in defeating the British. So there are a lot of unanswered questions and that we still need to get to. So to end, I'm saying it is not enough to read books. Moreover, one of the things that is interesting about history is that each era presents new questions which historians must ask of their data. Now today, we are very environmentally conscious. 
And uh, as historians look at these documents, matters related to the environment would actually be a part of the questioning of the data. New evidence leads to reassessment and reclarification. The story of Chatre is not fixed in stone. Despite the difficulty of rehabilitating the story of his people and recovering his narrative. So that's true in Scribbler when he said that he had learned that in school and nothing could change that. But obviously quite unaware that history is not a dead subject where everything is cast in stone. The villain of or the villain so described by the British is now our national hero. And this month, we celebrate the dismantling of what I call colonial psychological violence. With those words, I just want to thank you very much and the end here.